welcome to the webcast for the launch of Relay. This is going to be flight one of the series, and the rocket is sitting here right behind me. This webcast is delayed about five hours from the actual time of launch. I do this because I don't have the crew or equipment to stream live on site, and it actually allows for a much higher quality stream. If you've been following along, you'll know that the last time we launched a rocket, it actually failed. That was Echo TV9, which launched on December 21st of 2016, exactly one month ago. After investigating the cause of failure, it was determined that the hardware calibration of the thrust vectoring mount was at fault for Echo TV9's failure. Using thrust vectoring is a tricky thing, and hardware calibration is extremely important in this case. What happened with the most recent Echo launch was essentially an error between what the computer thought it was doing with the thrust vectoring mount and what was actually happening. With the new thrust vectoring mount designed for relay, hardware calibration can happen up to minutes before launch, which couldn't happen with the old thrust vectoring mount on Echo. Now let's get into what's actually going to happen today. Relay will fly up to about 150 feet above ground level. At that point, it will deploy its drag fins. Those are the fins at the top of the rocket with the numbers on them. The drag fins act to shift the center of pressure to the top of the rocket so that as it falls, it comes straight down and not sideways or some other orientation. After falling for a little bit under the drag fins, the vehicle will stabilize. Well, we hope, that's what we're testing today. Then the chutes and legs will open, allowing for relay to land softly on the ground without damaging any of the components on board. Most of this rocket is flying brand new hardware that has not been tested yet. This means there's a decent chance for in-flight failure today. Ideally, the rocket will fly straight up and give us good measurements on how the drag fins perform in flight. But as we saw on the last webcast, that doesn't always happen. No matter what happens, it'll be important to learn from the results of today's test. We'll head over to the launch site now as we prepare the vehicle at around T minus two minutes. Reading from the BPS SOP, page one, T minus two minutes on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. Moving to page two, arming GSE. Locked and armed, begin automated flight pattern for aerial coverage. AC is active, AC is active and running flight plan 1, T minus 120.
All right, so let's review how today's flight went. After lifting off, relay stabilized itself for a little bit actively using the thrust vectoring system. About two thirds of the way through the first burn, the rocket started to tip over a little bit. I'm not exactly sure what happened, but this is looking like a combination of hardware and software issues. Right here, I'm looking at the x-axis of the angular orientation of the vehicle versus the commands that were sent to the thrust vectoring mount. You can see here as the blue line dips, the purple line stays stagnant. That's because I have a limiter in the code that won't let the mount gimbal beyond a certain point. I do this to protect the hardware in the mount so it doesn't accidentally rip itself apart. That said, I've been pretty conservative lately with the values I've been setting here. With a little bit of engineering, there's probably the opportunity to get about twice the performance of this purple line. That covers the baseline of our first issue. The second issue is that nothing deployed. No shoots, no legs, no drag fins. This is certainly a problem because we will definitely need those things if we want to land. Here's the relay rocket. It's a little bit dirty, a little bit messed up, but it's still in pretty good condition, considering it fell from about 120 feet. The most interesting thing to me here is that none of the nichrome wires that usually release these rubber bands actually fired. All of them are still intact and in good condition. I can already narrow this down to exclusively a hardware problem. If we look at the code, we'll see that all of these things were actually commanded to trigger by the computer, and the only fault was that it didn't happen in real life, which means that the fault takes place on the hardware level. If I had to take a guess as to what happened, it's probably that we had an electrical short. This means that somewhere along the way, one of the three pairs of alligator clips on the vehicle started touching each other, which would mean no current or voltage went through the nichrome wire and nothing deployed. That said, there are already provisions in the standard operating procedure to avoid this type of thing. Right underneath checking integrity of articulating pad equipment is check for electrical shorts in any nichrome releases on the vehicle. I did this during the pre-flight checks, but didn't find anything. There's a lot to learn from today's flight, and I wouldn't consider it a failure in any respect. This vehicle was the first in its series and was flying with a lot of new hardware and a lot of chances for things to mess up. The future of the Relay Rocket is bright, and I'm excited to see what I can do to improve the system. As always, I'm going to look through the data and footage to find out what went wrong. If you want to follow along with the investigation, you can follow me at Joe Barnard on Twitter or go to www.bps.space. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you at the next launch.